Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this InnoLogs session on Wealth of Talent. Uh, my name is Anu Naik, and I am um, someone who is part of this project uh, based on the research that was do done by IAL. And uh, just to you know, kind of kickstart this uh, afternoon session, um, I have a couple of um, you know announcements so that you know we can have a good uh, interactive session with all of you. Um, there is uh, the Q and A uh, mode that is open up for you. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask the panelists, please put in your questions in the Q and A uh, mode. Um, the chat box is also open for you in case you are not able to hear or you're, you have some problem with the video or with the slides, please, hi please highlight it to us so that we can take care of those uh, uh, issues. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, I have uh, more than 20 years of experience in, in the field of talent learning and org development uh, across Asia Pacific. Um, I have worked in multiple industries. So I'm somebody who's a practitioner and have been part of the inside story of, of organizations. And uh, much of my experience, uh, the knowledge and my practice has been around um, organizational development, change management, talent strategy, and overall uh, framing the people agenda of multinational companies. So um, my role here today is uh, to moderate this uh, fantastic engaging session and to bring you this wealth of talent um, panel and uh, data and research to all of you, along with a fantastic and esteemed panelist that I have. And uh, so can I request my panelists to please switch on their video while I just kind of introduce each one of them. Great, thank you. So um, the first person that I would like to introduce is uh, Sahara. And, uh, you know, Sahara is actually, uh, she's a researcher with, uh, with IAL and uh, most of her, you know, the, the research is around uh, political economy. And uh, she is uh, uh, involved in comparative research and uh, marshals all the uh, data to reinterpret dominant understanding of human potential in each culture. So uh, the uh, wealth of talent research is hers, her brainchild. She's going to bring a lot of valuable information about this to each one of us. And uh, we would be listening to Sahara in a little while. I'm also pleased to introduce uh, Brian, who's the founder of Testing Ground. Um, and what he does in uh, Testing Ground is that he has helped uh, more than 200 startups uh, and companies to test their ventures across the ASEAN region and India. Um, he's also the entrepreneur in residence in uh, Singapore in University of social sciences and a fellow at the Singapore Center for Social Enterprise. Um, the, the key thing for, for me and for our team is that he's a certified platform designer and Brian helps companies achieve zero uh, distance to their customers by applying platform thinking to their business and people's strategies. Um, we also have Hongi, uh, who's the principal consultant in Psych. Um, consulting. Hongi has 20 years of extensive experience across both the public service and MNCs um, in Singapore and it, uh, across Asia. Um, he, he, his expertise is of development uh, and he has uh, introduced many initiatives across a wide span of industries and startups. And uh, he specializes in cultural transformation, helping the organizations to effectively link up people processes to business and outcomes. 
So before before we kind of you know go into the real wealth of talent, I just want to kind of say that uh, this is such a timely topic for each one of us because um, because of you know the two years that we have uh, gone through COVID and uh, the disruption has really been felt. The pain has been felt across the workforce and the talent landscape, and there are so many different things that are happening there are different moving parts that are going on different trends that are going on right now and and we will uh, get to hear sahara talk a little bit about you know the different types of imperatives that are governing all all our um, research and and what we are doing the work that we are doing on wealth of talent and she will cover uh, aspects of you know the business imperative um, the talent imperative, which is, you know, the great resignation and the culture of burnout. She'll also cover about, you know, a work for um, students that are more and more students that are graduating and becoming very qualified. So there is some social and policy imperative as well. But before I hand over to her, I, I have to say that one of the things that we constantly hear is that we have to win uh, to be a winner, we have to fight the war of talent. And that seems to be the kind of narrative that everybody believes that if you really want talent in your organization, and if you really want to have a good business strategy and a business transformation and sustainability, you, you have to do war for talent. We will be coming up with a different lens, a different view of you know, how the talent needs to be looked at and that is the wealth of talent. And, uh, and one of the trends that, you know, I was reading an article uh, by Larry Fink, who's the CEO of BlackRock. And he mentioned, he, he actually wrote a letter to all his stakeholders. And, uh, you know, I just picked it up, which I found it very interesting. And I wanted to share that with you. And he said that, you know, uh, businesses have to constantly reinvent and companies that fail to evolve to meet the needs of their clients, their shareholders, their employees, the communities that they are part of will find themselves unable to attract top talent, threatened by more innovative competitors across the industry. So how, how true that is. And, and that's what we hope uh, to bring to you through the wealth of talent and how this different model, this framework or the lens, as you may call it, can make this shift for you to see and understand and take away uh, from this afternoon session. So let me invite Sahara and uh, Sahara over to you to share more about the research that has been done around this area of wealth of talent. Thank you so much, Hanu, for the fantastic introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. Very happy to um, be here today, this afternoon, and um, thank you for joining us to discuss this very important topic of our time. I think if I present make this presentation one year ago, the impact would be different than if I've done it today. Um, bring, bringing to for some very very key pressing issues of our times, as Anu rightly uh, highlighted, you know we are in a period of um, serious decisions that need to be made of how we want to organize ourselves as a society, not just in Singapore, but in various parts of the world, um, to look at, to tackle some of these big issues that will impact not just our livelihoods and our sense of purpose in, in this world, but more importantly, the next generation. The decisions that we make today will impact significantly the the fortunes, I would say, of the next generation. And these three key imperatives of our time are rarely talked about as though uh, together. Usually they are always tackled separately, but they are part of a bigger um, drive or change of the issues that we are facing, governments are facing, societies are facing. The first I want to highlight is the great productivity decline. Although many of us are thinking that this is a period of significant technological innovation, 
a significant investment in education and, tra and training. Um, you know, corporate agendas trying to, to shift um, uh, to new ways of doing things. The bigger trend that we are observing is actually the great productivity decline. Uh, this has been documented extensively and I will, I will bring up some measures of that uh, uh, in, in a bit. But this actually suggests that something in the corporate world needs to shift. The second part is the talent and this is so uh, well um, uh, uh, discussed in the last couple of months uh, as part of the great resignation, the employee burnout, the sense of not being fulfilled by work, etc. And we've also talked about the social imperative of graduates flowing into the workforce, be it uh, with a diploma or a degree and, um, and you know, having exper experience, but more importantly, having the skills at such an extensive level that probably we didn't have 50 years ago. This imperative is how do we actually marshal them up together into a new way of driving um, well-being, a new way of driving economic growth that is meaningful, that is productive, that actually um, leads to uh, greater sharing of wealth. I think these are the three key imperatives that we need to deal with. Um, in essence, what we actually want and what the world needs right now is a new type of corporate organization. This discussion is not a Singapore discussion. This is a global discussion. Um, we are bringing it today uh, as a discussion uh, among us in Singapore. How ready are our workplaces for this? If Singapore is a global city and we want to be a global hub, we need to be ready to address the key imperatives of time. We have a contribution to make in that regard. Are we ready? Are Singapore workplaces ready? I'm going to share with you our findings of the state of workplaces in Singapore and sharing with you some observations that are pretty, I would say, concerning and, and, uh, and areas in which we may need to uh, move and shift uh, organization towards new ways of thinking. Anu spoke uh, a bit around the world for talent and I'll touch on that as well. But generally, what are the Singapore workplaces looking like right now? And um, we took, what we did in IAL was basically to uh, mine data across the national economy, a representative study of uh, establishments in Singapore. And we actually studied the practices of those organizations from a range of perspective, their business strategies, their people strategies, um, their reward systems overall. And we, we, we identified what were the strengths of certain types of workplaces and, and, and and um, the weaknesses of some of them. Let me share with you the findings, which I was very, um, well, not so fantastic. <laughs> Let's, let, let me put it this way. The vast majority of workplaces in, in Singapore do not uh, seek to optimize people's potential. Now, how do we read this chart? This chart um, basically uh, draws from data from the IEL's Business Performance and Skills Survey, uh, which is basically a national level study of establishments in Singapore. Um, I, that, that should be 2016, uh, there was a typo there. This was actually conducted in 2016, the data. And we are currently in the second round of a survey uh, with the most, most recent data. But in 2016, we already see that um, workplaces in Singapore are not optimal, all right? If you look at this, how do, how do we actually read this table? Let's start from uh, the, the, the bottom two, the constraint talent and zero talent. These are workplaces in which there is actually low professional discretion. By this, we actually mean that those jobs in these organizations are narrowly designed, meaning they actually require low skills content, so to speak, all right? So this is not untypical. All of us have heard of that, you know, um, uh, uh, those organizations that actually don't require high skills demand. And therefore, uh, they, they, they tend to not demand uh, um, the workforce to to exercise their, their, their craft, et cetera. This would not have been a problem 50 years ago. It is a problem now because the people that are actually flowing into these organizations more and more are actually very highly qualified. And this is the state of the enterprises challenge when their jobs are narrowly designed and yet they are actually uh, in a state where, where, where the workforce are having more and more demands. So that's part of one picture of the great resignation, yeah. Um, the second part of that picture of the great resignation is another aspect. See, it is 
perfectly um, understandable when the jobs are lacking in skills. But what happens when, despite having skills, your organization actually don't give you that discretion, don't trust you to have that judgment. And this has been the more recent trend uh, as expected by the World for Talent really, when in organizations, when you are actually having more people with high level of professional skills, um, the organization comes in to basically limit them for various reasons. And most of it is usually because they actually think this is the most sensible strategy to drive uh, productivity and performance. And, and, and therefore we actually see that the, the, the dominant approach in Singapore is actually the world for talent, where basically the people being employed in the country, in, in the company are high skills, but yet given low discretion. Now, we talk about it in effect, around 25% of the workplaces are the only places that are actually optimizing people potential. This is the category of uh, establishments that actually have high skills, high discretion, the, the business requires the um, workforce to actually exercise their judgment, their, their, their skills um, to drive the business forward. And, and in that way, they are actually also motivated and engage across the workforce. This is what we actually suggest is the uh, ideal optimized workplace that will address the three imperatives I outlined earlier. Now, there is this interesting thing based on the research, we actually saw that this category of firms is also the best one with the best reporting the best business performance. It then suggests to us, oh, what is the work of talent companies doing that's different from the rest, that's giving them this approach that is not the dominant approach, you know, we all would identify with a wealth of talent company, but many workplaces in Singapore are not um, uh, offering that kind of environment. What does a wealth of talent organization look like? And this is the um, range of practices that they actually have. And I would like to highlight that their practices are counterintuitive, or in other words, countercultural. They are not the dominant approaches that are being sold typically as best practices. In terms of business strategy, they are adopting a, a strategy of constant innovation, collaborative customization, what Brian will actually discuss later, the zero distance to customers. Now, why I say this is different and, and, and countercultural is because of this. The bulk of approaches in corporate world is actually trying to shift companies towards quickly being efficient. Innovation and efficient does, are not quite the same thing. So although companies are encouraged to be innovative, they are also encouraged to be efficient at the same time. And therefore efficiency-driven innovation is the dominant thrust. But in this wealth of talent companies, they accept that they may not be the most efficient organization. And that's fine. And that's exactly what they want because then it's not easy to replace them. If you are efficient, somebody will come in and become more efficient than you and you're out of it. But if you are always innovating, you always have something new um, for, that nobody else has. And when they actually have this um, collaborative customization with their customers, they are always ahead of the game. Now, because of this business strategy, they also don't um, separate conception, conception execution, meaning that a set of uh, people are considered as, uh, as the strategists and the rest are basically the operators. Um, no, in fact, because of the very business model that they have, everyone is expected to be part of their innovative um, development. And of course, talent management, they actually do not consider, they, they actually reject the role for talent paradigm completely. And I would like to highlight how uh, clear they are that this paradigm just cannot work. And, and therefore they basically said, no, there's no point. There is no single hero. There's no 10X engineer. It doesn't work that way. If you want innovation, it needs to include everybody. It's basically part of a team. And the other, the next um, aspect is around recruitment. And they actually go for non-traditional hiring. They are not trying to hire from um, the brand name companies, from the elite universities, you know, from, from it. They actually strive to basically go for um, non-traditional sources because that's a means for innovation for them. The other aspect of uh, um, the, the dimension of uh, wealth of talent firms is the reward strategy that they actually have. 
um, they basically, and this is really strange, right? You know, because we always hear about let's um, let's develop a, a few people and reward them differently because we need them more than the rest of the workforce. No, this uh, wealth, of, wealth of talent firms practice very differently. They actually spend a lot of time trying to create fair reward structure because that will actually not make the um, competition in the uh, establishment um, cutthroat. It's a safe environment, psychological safety is driven not just by um, how we treat one another, but it's actually inherent in the reward strategy as well. So this is another practice of uh, wealth of talent companies. The managerial approach is actually about growth mindset that they actually believe that people could. That's the basic assumption. They basically take a chance on people. They actually spend a lot of time empowering rather than predicting who is talent and who is not. Their learning strategy that, that the employees then employ is, is, is really generative, collaborative, coming together, boundary crossing. And, uh, and this is really, really the kind of uh, learning that actually pushes on what we call transformational, as opposed to adaptive, like, adaptive learning, where you are just trying to basically meet the requirements, et cetera. So this is basically a different type of learning organization. And the digital strategy that they employ is about bottom-up experimentation. You know, it's not about you being disrupted at all. It's basically part of the process of innovation. Everyone is empowered. And this is basically the the practices of the wealth of talent firms in Singapore. I've not had the chance to basically seek their permission um, for this talk for them to be identified, but we are working towards that, towards identifying who this wealth of talent uh, uh, firms are in Singapore and sharing it with the community. But I would like to highlight that this wealth of talent firms in Singapore, what they are doing is basically part of a broader trend in uh, countercultural movement globally countercultural movement towards employee discretion. This is happening in many parts, in small pockets, you know, as a kind of uh, 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 a challenge against that kind of traditional thinking that, uh, uh, that only a certain type of, of uh, employees are star players, uh, kind of thinking that, you know, business innovation can, 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 drive a, can be driven by a few smart people. Um, but rather, you know, a kind of, a kind of like trying to let the employees be driving the productive potential of the workforce. You could see an example here by Octopus Energy around how they are actually doing a similar approach. Sounds really very much like wealth of talent. And in higher China, it's the same. They are also experimenting. Now, this is the kind of experimentation that we actually need in, in, in driving that kind of imperatives I've highlighted earlier. And um, we need to because you know it's not just about the, the it's not just about um, the experience of the people that's also important and very very important. But companies need to understand that this is actually also about their survival. If they basically take those approaches that that they think have worked uh, in the past, um, they are going to run into serious um, sustainable issues. If you see the quote here by um, CEO Chang Ruiman of Haya. Fortune 500 enterprises have shorter and shorter lifespans. And this is really the reality. The reality is we need to reverse the declining quality of innovation in our era. And this must be driven by people and can be driven by people. And that will actually support the social objectives of, of what we want to drive in terms of the utilization of the potential of uh, society, given its heavy investments in education and training in the last 30 years. Here, um, I just want to end my, 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 my chat, um, my presentation here by basically um, reminding all of us that um, this is a time to be analytical, um, you know, a time to basically question some of the traditional paradigms that have been floating around um, and that, you know, um, looking at some of the ways in which we are um, putting forth those ideas that may actually be counterproductive. And uh, we will discuss this a bit more. Um, I would just like to say that we actually scrub the practices of the four archetypes that I've actually uh, highlighted. And that this is basically something that IAL will actually uh, prepare and share with the rest of the community. And you could recognize your company in this, uh, based on these archetypes, too much information here, um, but it is available and we will actually make this available uh, to all of you. Um, I will end here then. I know over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sahara. That was uh, a very nice uh, 
you know, sharing. And um, so while I uh, we wait for Brian and Hongi to switch on their video, I have a I have a question on somebody who actually uh, kind of picked up um, a typo. Um, the research actually you mentioned that it's been taken started since two thousand sixteen. And uh, and that's how you know it, you could see the four different types of organization. Now uh, tell us, Sahara, and also for the rest of them, um, uh, does that model still continue even after you know like so many years have passed? And yes. do you think it has worsened? Do you think you know um, it is about the same? Uh, what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a very good question. I know I I was I uh, I, I was thinking that this question would come up really. So what we did was basically we did a quick, um, a, a quick uh, assessment in 2021 around the archetypes. We think the archetypes still stand. So the four uh, dominant uh, archetypes still work um, in 2021. The proportion is what we are waiting for the next BPSS survey to basically show. The only thing I actually am worried about is that the proportion of web of talent firms have declined. That seems to be, uh, you know, if you're looking at the great resignation, if you're looking at the continuous trend of decline in productivity, we 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 can actually think that um, wealth of talent firms are likely to have uh, become fewer. Right. But yeah. So so watch the space. Yeah. 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 So this is always work in progress. It's not like you know one size fits all and. We understand research takes a long time, and uh, I think the insights are definitely um, very important to all of us. And uh, I, uh, it is something for for you know, you know, practitioners like us, people who are in the L and D in the org development space, um, get this valuable information from your research to be able to do something to shape this uh, workforce in that manner. And this wealth of talent is a fantastic model uh, if we kind of understand it. And we are hoping that we can bring the understanding of this model uh, with a little bit more clarity after our panel discussion. So uh, so with that, I mean, just stay there, Sahara. I'll come to you for with more questions. We will move into you know a discussion um, uh, format. And uh, so uh actually i'm also a panelist so you know you can ask me questions too and you know i will i will kind of support uh, the answers for my my co-panelists but uh, the first thing that uh, the first question that i will uh, lead on to is to brian um so brian i am actually wearing the hat of a business owner i mean like you've done a lot of uh, work in the space of um, <clears throat> the startups and helping businesses. Um, so, so as a business owner, my question to you is that, why should I shift? Um, what is the shift for me as a business owner? Um, so uh, tell me a little bit about it, you know, Brian, how, how do you perceive this? And how do you uh, advise business, businesses on this shift? Hey, thanks, Anu, for asking that question. Uh, I have the benefit of getting your question in advance. So I'm going to share a set of uh, very short slides, okay, if you don't mind, just so that everybody can see the same thing that I'm seeing. And the thing that I like to show everybody is, again, uh, Sahara mentioned uh, Zhang Raymin from Higher Group. And he actually said this, and I like this one. Why innovate, right? Because there are no successful companies. No company at this moment can say, we are successful and we will always be successful. It's impossible for them to say that. So he used a word that instead of saying that, oh, innovative and all that, he uses word relevant. Only companies that remain relevant uh, are the ones who will continue, right? But how does he envision this? He says a business should be zero distance to customers and have a network mindset. This statement of zero distance to customers blew my mind. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I teach startups and I help startups and companies to apply lean startup to test their ideas out. And the number one principle behind lean startup design thinking or agile is that the customer's voice should be heard. But some people say, yeah, we hear the voice, but they do it through surveys, they do all kinds of stuff, but they don't really, really hear the unadulterated voice of the customer. And where does that voice usually come from? It usually comes from the employees who are interfacing the customer support, the people at the retail shops. They are the ones who have it. And that's why 
Zhang Rimi added on and said, that's why we need to have a network mindset. And this is especially important for Singapore companies or companies in general, right? Is to realize that there is a shift. The shift is that you're no longer just, I am a company, you come to my place, you do what I say, you do what I tell you to do, I know best, you are here just as machines in a car, uh, of course in a machine, right? We know that's not true. Most HR people are definitely more uh, enlightened than that, but yet the execution of it fairly same, <laughs> right? But if you shift your mindset and says, in order for us to become relevant and in order for us to empower our customer, our employees who know the customers to innovate, to start up with new stuff, then the company must become like a platform, must become mm -hmm. like a platform. It must enable employees to work with each other, work with people outside the company, work with the customers, and even work within the management, even though usually uh, management and uh, employees tend to uh, fight like crazy, right? So, but not true anymore. I think that's why when I heard about wealth of talent approach, I was very excited because it jived with a lot of stuff that I'm seeing even in the startup realm, right? Uh, okay, I'm going to preface it uh, by saying not everything in the startup world is awesome, okay? Some things are super predatory. Uh, and I'm really thankful that when I met Sahara and she talked about wealth of talent, and I was excited because I say, yes, there needs to be a shift because we can see how platforms can take from a place of cooperation to competition. Uh. So as time goes on, they cooperate, cooperate, and until finally one day they say, oh, I need to make money now. Then they start competing <laughs> and it becomes, uh, and you see that happening in the large platforms. Uh, I'm not going to say in a public forum, but you know, all these giant e-commerce platforms and everything, right? They start off very cooperative and then end up, there will come a point in time, it becomes predatory, right? They will have to take away things. They have to start figuring how to squeeze every margin up because they need to become profitable. Uh, and exactly this is kind of what I want you all to understand is that there is always potential. There's always potential. And it's just that long time ago, long time ago in the industrial age, we designed for the mass market, mass, mass, mass. But today's world, mm -hmm. nobody's looking for mass anymore. Huh? They're all looking for me, me, myself, I, and what can you do for me? Which means the potential at the ages starts increasing, the ability to deliver for the customers increase. Uh, so just today I read about uh, Amazon. They just launched Amazon Style. So Amazon Style is basically a fitting room. And in that fitting room, before you go there, right, you can choose your clothes already on Amazon shopping, right? Or you can go to their physical store, scan the QR code, and then they will let you know all the clothes are ready at fitting room number 24. You go in there, your name is there, you start choosing the clothes, which one you want, and maybe they say you might be interested, you click on that, they will bring it to your fitting room. And Amazon has brought together the logistics, the technology, their customer recommendations and everything into a physical space. So everybody say, oh yeah, no more, uh, no more, uh, on, uh, everything is online shopping, forget about offline. And you see Amazon actually going the other direction. And how come they can, and again, some things Amazon does, I won't completely say it's well for talent, but at least one thing they understand is that they are a platform, right? And this shift is happening because potential is growing at the age. And I will end off with just this statement here. Uh, a platform is a strategy run by a shaper, not no longer just CEO, top-down innovation, all right? But it's a shaper. There's a group of people who shape who shapes the platform that wants to mobilize, support, and ecosystem in creating value. Very powerful. It's no longer top-down, left, right, bottom up. No, it's just about the ecosystem. Everybody's important. And how do we then create value? And uh, there's so much more that I think Sahara has to share about wealth of talent and the concepts behind it. Uh, what I feel is that there is an opportunity to do that. And, and of course, I'm part of the team. I do highly encourage everybody who's listening in right now that if you are interested to say, hey, what, what can we do with wealth of talent? I'm keen. Uh, we do have a link that you can click on and join us uh, because they say, hey, I'm keen to figure out how to be a platform company. I'm trying to figure out whether I can use wealth of talent. I don't want to be left behind. Uh, then this is your chance because uh, we are looking to work with companies, right? And, and see some of the new stuff that we are coming out with. Does it help, right? Uh, so I just want to end here. I know it's a very long thing. I took a long time, but I, I think I, I need to express my excitement at what Sahara and her team and IL team right, have, has, uh, have done uh, because I can see as an innovation consultant, this is the missing piece. 
every time somebody comes to me and says, hey, Brian, we ought to be innovation. Now, can you do the workshop? Now, can you advise us? I say, but what's the point if you're, the way you manage people the same? And even when you manage people, you think that it's only one way, right? Which is, uh, which is that you, you, you have to tell them and say, oh, we now have an innovation program. You join. <laughs> it's like, that, that's not going to work. Okay, no, not saying it's uh, not a bad move. At least it's moving. But I wish it was more, uh, more open. And I love what uh, Zara said, uh, more discretion to the employees. Okay, so I'm just going to pause here for a while. I'll let the other panel members join in and, and, sure, and I'll also sure. share. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, so uh, we'll come back to that. I mean, I think there will be an opportunity to you know, delve a little bit more on it. Um, but let me uh, go to Sahara for now. Um, so uh, Sahara, I, I'm looking at, you know, like uh, you, you, we all know that there is kind of, you know, inherent contradictions between what companies say that they want to do uh, versus what they are actually doing. So what is your comment and what are your thoughts around that? Thanks, uh, Anu, for, for, for the question. And thanks, Brian, for, for supporting this research and, and your excitement at this. And, and that's precisely the issue here. Whenever I present a web of talent uh, concept to many companies, um, the, the practitioners are the most excited. And then that's when they are like, yeah, that's actually what we want to do. But, you know, we are actually driven in other ways. Why? Why would you say that? Because the current best practices in which people are moving are always around making it smaller, smaller, a smaller group of people, a smaller group of people to, to, to develop, you know, um, creating distinction within the workforce or what we call stratification. The idea that if I actually only are working with a small group of people, then um, what happens then that it's easier to manage and then we can roll it out to the rest of the organization, right? And the problem is this, the moment you actually set up such, such structures, what actually happens is you incentivize people very differently. It then, not, it, it then becomes more of a case of how do I get into that elite group, right? You know, it's not about the customers anymore. It's not about um, my, my professional judgment anymore. It becomes so, um, it, it, it becomes how do we game the system? Mm -hmm. and, and that's precisely what companies need to understand. And a huge part, I feel, is actually about being data-driven about it. If you think this is a best practice, uh, let's see how do you actually, what does the data tell you? And the research data from us, when we actually speak even to all these high potential um, employees, is that it's very constraining. Mm -hmm. Even then, I have actually have a, a, a group of firm, a group of people that have been identified as though they are special. They feel it's very constraining because nobody can innovate in, in, in such a, a stifled manner. It just doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Sahara. And I think, you know, uh, just to add to the model, in my view, it's a very, very inclusive and a very refreshing uh, framework, the wealth of talent, um, because that's where we value every individual that is part of an organization, that is part of an entity. And so as, as we say that, you know, in the war for talent, it's just a few heroes, as you mentioned. And whereas, you know, in wealth of talent, you know, everybody's a hero and uh, you, you uh, value each one of them for, for the contribution that they make. And when you value each one of them uh, in the framework of the wealth of talent, you will find that you know, automatically they will go above and beyond, innovate, contribute to the organization's performance. So um, now I'd like to uh, invite in? me, my colleague, oh, no, sorry. I can I just add in? Uh, I think it's important that people really understand what Sahara is mentioning at this point about the stratification, right? That there is an elite group, you know. Uh, things are too complex nowadays that one team of people can handle it or even one person can handle it. It's way too complicated. Uh, it, it, and it's so complicated that if you don't enable opportunities to appear, right? Even at the ages, uh, and you only focus on one team and we... Many times we call it an innovation team or <laughs> a group of people, right? And that end up, what happens, it tells everybody else is, I switch off. I don't need to think about it. <laughs> I, yeah. I will just let that group of people figure it out or I'll write some, 
suggestion, right? A suggestion and then pass it on to everybody. Or I join the hackathon and I get some recognition for it. But those are very token gestures. It's like you put in a lot of effort. And I know because I actually worked for a major bank and I did a business transformation there, right? And I was trying very hard to convince them that you can't keep doing this because the more you do it, the more you send the message that it is for an elite group when actually you're telling me we should try to encourage more people to be innovative, right? Yet the very actions that we are doing is telling everybody, no, you can't because during the hackathon, we only a top three can win. <laughs> like, huh? Yeah. Like, what makes you think the top three? So even within a small event, right, that you're supposed to encourage innovation, you still reward people at the top. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I'm like, huh? Come on. I'm not saying don't reward people, right? And I think in the words of Sahara, in the words of the theory, right, we call it a compact reward structure. Right? You, you don't overly reward the person at the top versus everybody else. Now that blows people's mind, right? Because it's like, huh? What? But that's our normal practice, right? Top 10% get all the <laughs> glory here and the rest of them don't get it. So right. I think it's important to set that context that we're not here to try to break down and say what everybody's doing is wrong. We're just saying that there is a different way of looking like lens, huh? a way of looking. And I think it's very important that that lens get changed first. You need to change that lens because otherwise everything that we're about to say, when you contrast it with existing fact, you know, the, the way that people tend to look at talent, right? Like war for talent, which I think Hong Yi might be talking about soon since he's the expert at it, <laughs> right? The, the, the lens that you wear, then whatever we're saying will always be very jiving. He's like, oh, I cannot take it. So, so I just want to emphasize that because uh, I needed that change. I just need to let you all know, I needed that change because without that change, uh, no way everything that's about to be said uh, uh, can understand. Uh. <laughs> so I need to change my lens first, take off my <laughs> lens. Okay, over Thank to you. you. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. So, so I'll, I'll bring in Hongi um, at this stage. And uh, Hongi, you know, Sahara, mentioned about those eight aspects of the you know octagon uh, framework that we have and uh, and uh, i think many of it has uh, you know kind of overlap between for uh, learning and org development um, kind of you know uh, programs and initiatives so um, how do you view this from from an l and od uh, aspect for, for the lens of uh, wealth of talent. How do you view that? Oh, what thank are the you, areas? Yep, thank you, Anu. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Hongi, and I must say that the um, conversation I have with Sahara has been uh, over two years. When she first shared about the wealth of talent, I was very skeptical. And then um, in the last two years, we have been sparring to make sure that we understand where each of us are coming from. And after two years, I must say that it has been a very refreshing experience to not only work with her, but the, the team as well. I think to understand this, I, I just bring across two points. I think that's I think that's a more important two points. To do that, let me share screen because I think it's good to recap of what Sahara has shared. Okay. Um, the screen that I wanted to share is the one about um, the dimensions. I hope you can see now the eight dimensions that uh, Sahara shared. I think it can be quite a mouthful. And uh, initially, when I first uh, saw it at the time, I was also quite dumbfounded by it. But I want to share my first point. The first point that I want to share is that we need to be mindful that some of our long-held truth, I will use the word close inverted comma, truth, may not be truth. So for example, uh, when we talk about talent management, we talk about the fact that we need to have an elite group. And the strongest argument is that, and I belong to that advocate previously, and I was advocating that the strongest argument is that we do not have resources, so it must be wise, let's go identify our elites, and then we pump our resources to it. That seems to be the prevailing uh, train of thoughts, or what I call the lens that has been uh, ingrained among the management. Sorry, Hongi, Hongi. Sorry for interjecting. Can you do full screen, please? Oh, okay, sure. Yeah. Give me a second. Will that be better? Yeah. Okay, so like what I said, so the prevailing mindset about talent management is let's look at the elite and let's make sure that, you know, we pump the right resources to the right people and then they'll bring us the returns as well. However, I think the more fundamental way is that when you look at this wealth of talent, we do not see it in silo. Each of these dimensions does not operate on its own. And I thought one of the greatest 
mind-blowing thing or the conversation I have with Sahara is that when we choose to see only talent management by itself, that argument stands. However, maybe the fundamental issue is not the elite group or the smaller group. The fundamental group is that maybe we have not designed the job properly so that we can consider the talents of the other 90%. That's why we only focus on the 10%. So one of the things that I want to share at least to break through for, for some of us, including myself, was that when we look at war of talent, we tend to see only within one of the dimensions. But when we look at wealth of talent, we are seeing it within the whole eight dimensions. And that itself is a wealth of its own because you are not just focused into a certain mindset only. So that's one area that got me uh, thinking further, even in the conversation I have with her. The other thing is that, the other side, it doesn't mean that everything that we talk about, every established practices that we talk about falls under the wall for talent. There are some practices that are still relevant. So for, the, for example, under learning strategy, the need to design good learning outcomes, the need to have workplace learning, will still be relevant even in uh, the current wealth of talent. So we need to be mindful that there are two things that we need to take note of. And that's why we want to encourage those people who are who's listening in to come and join us. We want to not only develop this holistic approach of looking at talent beyond just one dimension, we want to also see what are some of the practices that we can bring over based on current practices that is still useful for wealth of talent and grow this pool further. I'll pass the time back to Anu. Yeah, yeah. So, so you are uh, just to kind of you know understand and you know lead into the discussion here. You are saying, Hongi, that there are so so this is not like in silo. It has to be seen as an integrated approach of yes. wealth of talent, right? So so that's one. Second thing is that you know there are certain things that people are already doing, practices that people are already you know um, uh, doing in their organization, and uh, and if you look at it from the wealth of talent lens, you will realize that you have already progressed in that area. Yes. And so bringing that in into an integrated manner for wealth of talent is the right way to approach this. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So okay. it, speaks to, it speaks to two groups of people, who people who have very strong view and well ingrained in a certain way, park aside the idea, see it from a different lens. Yeah. Then for those who are also well grained in a certain area, it doesn't mean that what you're doing is wrong too. It can still be a wealth of talent practices as well. Yeah, correct. Correct. So uh, uh, one question before I go to Sahara, and I think we are kind of uh, running out of time. We are being reminded, but uh, let me just kind of uh, finish with Hongi. Um, so all this why you find that many of the corporations, including Singapore, you find that, you know, uh, there's a lot of, you know, kind of war for talent practices, which is the dominant kind of a thing. Now, what are some of the good elements of the war for talent that can be um, remapped into you know, the wealth of talent. Are there any thoughts around that, Tony? I think the most important thing is that we do not see talent in isolation. Mm -hmm. Okay, most people, when they talk about talent, even in the current moment, they tend to see it in isolation from business. Is a person be able to that means their criteria for selecting their talents may not even be related to business. It could be that this person is high profile, he can talk well, uh, he can share his perspective well, but is it relevant to the business? Mm -hmm. This question will still be relevant in the wealth of talent. Actually, it's even more relevant in the wealth of talent yeah. because you need to map that back to the business. If not, the definition of a talent needs to be redefined. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you, Hongi. Um, Sahara, one question for you um, on this is that, uh, which I think a lot of people would be thinking, it's great in terms of you know the research that has been done. What is, what is the trend in the, especially in the companies in Singapore, and uh, and you know the the great um, the framework that you know has been kind of shared with everybody. The question people would have is that how do I do it? And how do I implement this framework in within my organization? And uh, is it you know like you know step by step? Can it be done at individual level? Can it be done at team level, organization level? So throw some light on this, uh, Sahara. What what can be done? Thank you, Anu. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you. Brilliant question. So what, what, where, where, where are the levers for change? How do we do it? That's a very, very um, difficult question. And I say it's difficult because, you know, we are connected that the ideal state is basically for it to be an organizational change led by the top. As in signaled by the top, supported through all levels of uh, employee uh, engagement units, functions, as you can see, and as Hongi rightly pointed out, you can't um, develop it in isolation, just this part, you know. So somebody say, hey, I want the learning strategy of Wealth of Talent Company, but I don't want the rest. No, you can't because if you basically are engaged in that kind of rich learning, you actually need those jobs to be rich. You know, your business strategy requires it to be rich. You are always working with your customers. So basically it's kind of like integrated. So we need to understand that that's actually the ideal state. And if, um, and I'm, and I would like to highlight that some of our wealth of talent firms did not start out as wealth of talent. It mm. was a journey for them. So mm. it can be done. The second part I wanted to highlight is that we found wealth of talent across a range of industries, across a range of firm types. It actually suggests that wealth of talent is not uh, unique to a particular industry, say FinTech, say um, uh, professional services. It's actually possible in retail. It's actually possible in f &B. Can you believe it? You know, it's, it's possible in manufacturing. Now, the main thing is basically the innovation in terms of pushing your own assumption as a company of what you can and cannot do. You know, it's basically trusting that actually there might be a different way of doing things. And this is really where um, sometimes it's really hard. And what you can actually do is maybe take some steps, steps in terms of a data-driven approach. Take one area, do it, collect the data, convince your stakeholders, take another step, you know, and, and then, you know, and, and bearing in mind that you need to do it iteratively, etc. because what you're doing here is socialization into a new way of being as an organization. That cannot happen overnight, but you need to take steps and you need to see where are the steps that are taken in the direction. You actually need to learn and observe from um, the firms with web of talent practices and see if that you could adapt it for your organization. And usually you can, if you basically like what um, Brian and Hong Yi said, um, uh, put a new lens, you know, and, and you know, uh, challenge your own assumptions. And because it has uh, the, the biggest incentive, I think um, companies will have is that this is also the firms that actually report the best uh, business performance in terms of profit, in terms of uh, in terms of market share, etc. So you you that that should be good incentive for thinking about moving in this direction. There are different types of firms, so it really starts from where is your start point. You know whether you are a wolf of talent firm, whether you are a constrained talent firm, whether you're a zero firm. Understand where you are first, and then map out the steps of where you want to be and do the. And, and do it as a series of activities. Hmm. Yeah, wonderful. I, I think uh, the businesses really need different way of doing things and this model uh, surely kind of, you know, paves the way for um, how we, you know, we uh, look at talent and um, uh, it's, it's very enlightening and very refreshing in, in terms of the wealth of talent research and the work that is happening. And, um, we are not left with very, uh, very much time, uh, unfortunately, but, you know, hold on there. Um, um, we will come to you uh, again for uh, the Q&A section. But uh, one thing that I would like to uh, leave you with uh, is the story of a monkey analogy. I don't know how many of you have actually heard of um, the five monkey story. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, um, it's, of course, related to the organizational culture because uh, as Sahara mentioned that it is a journey and it doesn't, uh, you know, work overnight. It has to be done in steps. So this five, five monkeys were placed in a cage, okay? And uh, as a part of an experiment and um, in the middle of the cage, there was a ladder and on the top rung of the ladder, there was bananas. And obviously, you know, monkeys and bananas, there's an intimate relationship. So 
you know, whenever a monkey ran up the ladder to get a banana, uh, the experimenter would spray ice cold water on all the bananas. So, so, and when another, per, another banana, monkey tried doing the same, uh, so the rest of the monkeys uh, to save themselves from the icy cold water spray, they pulled this fellow down and made sure, beat him up, that he doesn't walk up uh, or, you know, climb up the ladder to get the banana. And in, in, in the progress of the experiment, the experimenter actually then um, replaced one of the five monkeys with a new monkey. And uh, so this new monkey, of course, didn't know what was happening inside. So when he saw the banana, sorry, I say he, I don't know why, but when it saw the bananas also ran up the ladder, and uh, and uh, to the the you know the uh, principal of the uh, experiment, uh, the rest of the bananas pulled him down and then you know beat him up, and uh, slowly slowly the experimenter actually replaced all the monkeys. So every monkey that came in was new at the end of it, but they all started conditioning their behavior in such a way that they realize that that's the behavior, that's the social norm. So they comply by it. So their motivation to get the banana was over. And uh, sometimes, you know, and it's always like that, you ask somebody a question like, why do you do this? And when you ask that question, the person will probably look at you thinking that, are you insane? That don't you know that this has always been this way? So this is exactly the five monkey uh, mindset that you know most of us get. So whenever we are talking about talent and people and you know and uh, and the workforce, everybody has been conditioned to a social norm. Now businesses need a different lens, a new way of doing things, and we have to break out of that norm, that social norm, to look at how we can innovate and how we can bring the wealth of talent as a model to prescribe to in, in your organization. Fantastic. So um, since we have um, kind of, you know, come to the end of our time, I'm just looking, we are about four o'clock here. Uh, I see there is a question. Um, okay. Um, I think you'll decide. So the question is, thank you for the insights, all the panelists. Totally agree that firms should approach the wealth of talent practice. Hence, does leadership play a key role to set the tone of the approach? And how are we going to break the leadership's mindset? Now, um, I know that uh, Hongi is very passionate about this. And so I will, I will first ask Hongi, would you like to answer this question? And then if anybody else has anything to add. Sure, sure. Um, I, was, I was laughing at it because um, when Sahara and I first started this conversation two years ago, uh, she didn't have uh, eight dimensions, she had six dimensions. Then along the way, she decided that leadership is a key dimension, you know, after much debate between the two of us. So, so I, 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 I will let her share later why she decided to put in that as a dimension. But from my perspective is this, I think if you really want to change um, business leader mindset, right, you need to show how does it help the business. Um, let me give you a good example. Uh, I'm a psychologist by training. And what I do is that as I uh, give assess personality assessment for or leadership assessment for senior leaders, right? When I was much earlier in my career, I used to say things like, um, I'm looking at your profile, your consciousness needs to change. Then I then the CEO stare at me with a blank look because he's thinking, why are you talking? And in the words of one of the CEO, I still remember, uh, can you reduce your psycho mumbo jumbo to layman term? And then through the years, I realized that no, I shouldn't be saying terms like this, even though it's in the profile. I should be saying things like, you know, um, your this profile shows that you're a very detailed, conscious person. Then what is the implication behind it as well? So likewise, it's the same thing. If you want to change a business leader, you need to explain to them not the concept behind it, but to explain to them the impact of the concept to the business. I think that's the best thing that I can share in terms of changing mindset. You need to speak their language and you need to make sure that the language that you're speaking is relevant to them. 
maybe I pass the time to uh, Asara to add on as well. Yeah, I think Brian um, uh, is best place to answer this, Brian. Yeah, well, 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 thanks for the confidence, but uh, uh, just in case people <laughs> yeah. are leaving, uh, just let you all to know in the chat, there is a way for you all to register interest if you'd like to participate with us, because these questions that you're asking about how to implement and everything, we won't be able to cover in the eight, next eight minutes or so. Mm -hmm. So just indicate that you want to be part of this, and then there's a lot more sharing that we can do just to let you all know, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so, so from my point of view, is this uh, every change, like doing a startup, it starts with what we call experiments, right? And what experiments means, let's do the smallest thing possible to learn. So we call this the minimum viable product, right? So even in this case here, in order to convince somebody to make a change, what is the smallest thing that you can do to demonstrate the impact with the least effort that you can have? And as you do this with speed, that means if you say, stop trying to do like six month projects, 12 months projects, try and do something like two weeks. Like when I went into that fin chat, fin, the, the, the financial institution, right? And I needed to make a change. I didn't take six months. I didn't take a year. I, I took one month and I did the experiment and I demonstrate to them that I can take a POC concept, right? And reduce it to one month. Don't need six months to implement something. I can do it in a month. And I did it by rapid experimentation, right? And then I got confidence of one person, of two persons, of the boss, of the managing director. Slowly but surely, by doing rapid experiments, that's how it works. So my, I, I tend to prefer that approach because it means when I go to somebody, I show, I don't just tell. I come with results. I am not coming to you to tell you why. The second thing is that using words like zero distance to customers, very useful because zero distance to customers so that you can find new money, especially that's how I will word it, uh, will get people's attention very fast. Like, oh, zero distance, but how do you achieve that? <laughs> they say, well, that means we need to empower our people. That takes a different approach. Then we can talk. But if you use the same language of old to talk about stuff, then nobody's going to listen to you. Innovation and creativity. You know, like, okay, okay, I hear a lot already. You need a new lens, a new language in order to be able to speak it. Once you say it, people's interests aren't there, then the next thing they'll ask you, well, then show me, right? And that's the beauty of this thing that Sahara is doing because it's not come out from a random, somebody wrote a book uh, and then they decided to like, come out with this. We're not doing a book launch today, you know? Actually, this came from research and this is why I'm excited about it. And one of the things I suggested to Sahara was that, can we co-write a book around this, right? That means use the research and we invite the L&D community, the HR community, come around, let's figure out your companies together and let's write the story together, the books together. And that's also a wealth of talent approach. It means not one person is the author, everyone can be the author. So again, if you want, please just sign up with us, don't share with us, right? Uh, so that we can, we can run some of these uh, uh, projects together, small projects if you are also. But two things that are basically small rapid experimentation to show, don't tell. Second, new language, because it's only by new language and people are like, okay, now I'm curious because what is it that you're saying? All right? Right. Yeah. Thank you. So this, sorry, Sarah, did you yeah. want to say and, and add on to what um, Homi and Brian uh, are saying? Um, we are talking about a new way of working together as a community. Um, you know, the wealth of talent approach that what Brian Bisky says, let's share with one another. We are, we are up against something massive, you know, practices that have been uh, around for a long time, which actually means that the more we actually share our, our experiences um, with one another of trying to break this, the more we can come to what is possible, feasible, and what Brian says gives results. Because at the end of the day, the research that we have is not conceptual, it's empirical. It has shown to, to, to deliver results. And therefore, the way in which we want to do change management, um, we, we, we can learn from one another. I think the other thing I'm actually offering to the community is actually a way for research and uh, practitioners to work better together. You know, a lot of our best practices tend to take from um, uh, 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 um, universities that are outside of Singapore. Um, this research is actually developed by a university in Singapore by a research community, that, uh, by researchers that are actually plugged into the local uh, landscape. And we can then have conversations, what work, what doesn't work, you know, and we can actually apply uh, or, or, or use this entire process to learn and experiment together with one another. Right. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, uh, Sahara, for that uh, comment. Um, I also see uh, another question. 
that has come in relation to what I shared about the monkey story. Uh, so how to break out of the social norm? What is the tactical approach to do that? Um, so uh, a very good question and not something which is uh, really easy uh, to, to kind of, you know, uh, deal with. Um, but uh, what I would say is that, you know, um, wealth of talent actually is a bottom up approach all the you know the elements of that framework so whether it is innovation whether it is designing your job whether it is ideating whether it is pursuing your development it's all bottom up that means all inclusive everybody thinks through how they want to shape an organization now that's that's uh, quite a big thing to to you know kind of come to terms with but to break out of a social norm, one simple question you can ask is that if somebody says it has always been done in this manner, you can ask them that, why so? What's the rationale? Why it has been done in that manner? So give me, give me some rationale. So that way uh, the, the person, even, even as practitioners, you know, um, I always I always ask that question that you know, to, to kind of break away from the status quo. Why is it it, it gets, uh, you know, done in that manner? So something that, you know, you have to question, you have to put on your thinking hat. And that's when you open up avenues and doors of doing things differently. So I hope that kind of, kind of answers the question. Uh, um, do we uh, have, I don't think we have any more questions. They've all been answered. Uh, do we have any comments from any of the panelists at yeah, this so, point of time? Yeah, so Anu, I just want to add on to that one. Uh, how do you break social norms, right? So the story of meerkats is a, a good example. When, when there's not, there's a certain percentage, of, you need a certain number of meerkats in order for them to look out for each other. Uh, so predators will pick off enough meerkats, there will come a point in time that not enough meerkats to warn each other that there are predators coming. Um, and in similar case, it will become a point in time where the pack becomes strong enough and it actually helps each other. How do we even break the social norm? This is how we break, by people coming together, by saying that, hey, we hear this, we form a community. Like when I first started Lean Startup Community here in Singapore, I only had like, what, 10, 20 people, but slowly became 100, became 4,000. And then now every, every school will talk about, Let's, we got to test our ideas out, right? Don't need me anymore, you know? Um, but that's the idea of a platform. There will come a point in time where the community is big enough, you will look out for each other and the originator can take a step back already. So this, this thing is the tipping point. We need to find a tipping point. In your organization, it might be 100 people. Smaller ones, it might be three. Regardless, it is your minimum viable number of people. You need to find that number. And once you know that minimum viable number of people, it could be three in a department, then in every department, you will say that through my experiments, three people is enough to start seeding this. Then let's go find another three in another department, another one in another department. So that's how experiments and, and, and change happens, at least uh, how I will see it from a more experimental point of view. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So we've been told that we we have uh, time for just one more question. And uh, so I'll, I'll take a question here. Um, um, Sahara, this, this is of course to you. Um, do we have uh, any kind of data that shows the impact of uh, the, the wealth of uh, talent organization to how the, you know, the, the uh, business performance improves, the profitability improves, uh, higher you know, engagement of staff? Is there, is there any data that you can you know, share with us? And you know, how does that correlation work? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know, as I was um, highlighting, it was st st statistically significant um, in terms of the business performance of wealth of talent companies. Right, and, uh, and we actually developed a causal mechanism for that because basically um, the, the basic this reason that of wealth of talent companies is really that they want to create new things. They are in the space of innovation. They do not want um, standardized stuff. And in creating that new 
way of um, doing things, it actually means that they are creating new market share. Mm. They are creating new profits. Uh, you know, what, what Brian said, you know, the edges, you know, they're pushing it, right? And when they do that, obviously they are creating um, new uh, productive potential. And they do this by relying on their people. And they need that because without everyone on the team uh, coming together, collaborating, pushing um, their own boundaries uh, professionally, reaching out to what like Brian basically mentioned, you know, going out of the organization, going to the customers without a proper processes of harnessing those insights, that is not possible. Mm. So oftentimes we often, uh, we, we, we often look at business innovation as, as though it's actually something that happens because the business did it, you know, but no, it's always been driven by people. The people and the structures that actually allow those people decisions, uh, the, the decisions and the discretion of the people to, to say, hey, and this is where uh, it gets really interesting. The trust organizations need to have in their own people. And like I said, you know, we actually saw there were a lot of uh, examples of uh, people, uh, companies with low skills demand jobs. You know, the jobs actually are not designed, but increasingly many professional jobs, organizations do not trust them. That doesn't make sense at all, right? You know, you need to be able to trust and allow them to basically put up a case. And the moment you actually invest in that structures, you will actually see that those ideas are validated by one another. That means as an organization, you can actually have the confidence that if so many of my staff are actually say, yes, this is a good one, I should not be ignoring it. Rather than, you know, let me just turn to that special elite group. What do you think, you know? So that trust is, is really important. And without that trust, uh, uh, um, we, it, it will be hard for that people uh, energies to be converted into business performance. And mm -hmm. the work of talent firms have been able to do this brilliantly. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I mean, I think it's very important to have, you know, a workforce that you trust. And high trust uh, is uh, equivalent to, you know, high performance, business performance. And so, um, you know, it's, it's actually, you know, the intent is there of organizations to bring about it. It's more the, you know, the practical uh, ways uh, that are feasible for organization to, you know, kind of go on this journey. And that's the reason why, um, you know, Brian is putting out that link there for people who are interested to really, you know, evolve this study into a practice which uh, makes a difference for the, the, you know, the corporate landscape, uh, Singapore and beyond Singapore. Um, and we would be really, uh, you know, happy if, if uh, all of you would like to kind of, you know, join us and, you know, uh, shape this into something that can be a lens, a framework that can really bring something new and different for, for, you know, the businesses. And that's what businesses are looking for, new and different. The disruptions are happening, the disruptions will continue, but that new and different has to happen. And that this is just the right time because, you know, businesses are rethinking, reimagining new ways of doing things. So this is just the right time. Okay, wonderful. So we've come uh, to the end of our time. Uh, um, thank you so much, uh, my dear panelists. Um, was really insightful, uh, thought provoking, and very enriching information that you know you all shared. And I hope um, um, you know the audience find it useful. Um, and I think some, there were some comments that you know uh, thanking us for those you know clarifications and answering those questions um i will now uh, if if all of you are okay i will now hand it over to nilanjala uh, who will come in from uh, inologs uh, organization and share a little bit more how to close this session Yep. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Thank, thank you, You've everyone. You've got the stage now, so we have it over <laughs> to you. Okay, thank you. What a terrific discussion and interaction. I am so grateful to each one of you, as well as the audience.
and um, our in-lab team for having such a wonderful uh, discussion and interaction. We are thankful for each one of you to spare this valuable time and share with us more about wealth of talent, as well as how can you unlock people potential. There's even scope to uh, register interest. I think what more to ask. And a special thanks to Ms. Anuradha for hosting and uh, you know directing us all through this past one and a half hours. We hope the audience has enjoyed this session too. Um, we do have a webinar, uh, a survey towards the end of this session. So I would really um, yeah, like each one of you to give us your valuable feedback because this is what keeps us going forward. And uh, okay, so before I go any further, the Innovation Center has several activities and grants um, for the broader TAE sector, which I believe each one of us uh, here can benefit from. The first is a you know, plus challenge uh, and the run one is open. It's a $200,000 uh, um, grant where uh, you, know, you can uh, come and solve your learning challenges and all. The next is uh, about uh, a capability development initiative uh, and consultancy that uh, uh, in lab offers. It's more towards um, our adult educators as well as uh, training providers. So if there's interest, you, the QR code is there, just go ahead, or you can even uh, visit our website and uh, learn more about it. The next is about a learning innovation study that uh, we are having uh, here at InLab. So please feel free to, again, scan the QR code or uh, learn more about it from our um, website. And uh, any, any last comments from the panel or thank you? Okay, great. So thank you everyone um, for this session again. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, just take a couple of minutes to uh, fill in our survey and uh, let us know what are some of the topics you would like to have in future. And uh, yes, over to you, audience. <laughs>